A very good evening to all of you from Kuwait. On behalf of Sri Sri Lanka Kuwait chapter, I warmly welcome every one of you to our second day session, Thinking Like a Data Scientist. My name is Mohammed Bashir, and I'm an executive committee member of CS Sri Lanka Kuwait chapter. Some of you all may have joined for the first time. However, for the benefit of all the audience, I want to remind that in our previous session, we have learned fundamental concept of data science and the big data. Recording, recording of this first session is now available on our official YouTube channel. We have shared the link of the first session to your email addresses. In today's session, we are going to learn as a finance professional, how to get the maximum benefit out of the big data and the data science in your organization from our resource person, Tisara Watavana. Mr. Tisara Watavana has over eight years of experience in data science and data engineering, and currently works as a managing director at Boffin Institute of Data Science. He, has, he earned his master's degree in computer science from University of Colombo and his bachelor's from University of Moratua. And Mr. Tisara is a senior data scientist certified by the Data Science Council of America, and he holds a professional graduate diploma in IT awarded by the British Computer Society. I warmly welcome Tisara Vadavana on behalf of CA Sri Lanka Kuwait chapter. If anybody is having any questions, you will have the opportunity to submit the text questions on the Q&A panel. You may send your questions at any time during the session. We will collect the questions and address them during the Q&A session. So without taking much time, I'll hand over to Tisara. Tisara, over to you. Thanks, Bashir. Um, and uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending on where you joining us today. Uh, I hope I'm audible enough to everyone. Uh, so welcome to the second session uh, of Thinking Like a Data Scientist. Now, uh, last week, uh, we actually discussed uh, some of the basic concepts, right? Uh, about big data, about data science, and before you know uh, starting anything any data science or big data initiative what you need to keep in mind and um, what are the you know things that you need to do and you shouldn't right uh, so these are the things that we discuss so keep all those concepts all those um, do's and do, uh, don'ts in mind right uh, and which you know uh, we will keep reminding uh, about those uh, concepts and uh, things we discussed last week uh, during today's session. So today, what I have planned is, is a case study, right? So uh, I have selected a particular uh, business initiative. So last week discussed uh, as accountants, as uh, uh, finance managers and uh, business professionals, where you can easily uh, start uh, a data science or a big data initiative, right? So as accountants, you have the best view in terms of numbers, uh, I mean, about the, the entire organization. Uh, you are sitting on the uh, financial statements, you do this financial statement analysis, right? Uh, so that is the best place for you to start, okay? So let's keep that in mind and uh, let's, you know, start with some practical uh, business case, okay? Uh, where we can uh, uh, utilize data science and big data. So what I will do is I will take you through from the starting point business initiative till the implementation of a data science and big data solution, okay? So during this process, we will cover what are the key steps we need to follow, 
or else what we call the thinking like a data scientist process, right? That is what, what is important, right? That is what we are going to cover today, right? Okay, so imagine as, as a CFO, now this particular situation, Mr. Pereira, is the CEO for one of the largest uh, supermarkets uh, in the country, right? Uh, and the company manages uh, over 100 outlets, over 100 uh, supermarket outlets across the country, right? Uh, which sells more than 20,000 SKUs, right? So if you don't know the term SKU, that is stock keeping unit, right? It's, I think as financial professionals, you use the uh, term SKU, uh, it's more like a supply chain term, but a uh, stock keeping unit is you can say a, a specific item, right? Uh, not just the, the brand or the product, but you can add a lot of attribute to it. Maybe the size of the packet, uh, maybe um, uh, the color of, the, uh, of something, the model, right? So stock keeping unit is, uh, is you simply item, right? So you know, in a supermarket, you have number of SKUs, right? A uh, number of different categories could be from food and beverage uh, to personal care items, uh, then perishable items, frozen items, right? So it's very common that you will end up with number of SKUs in your portfolio compared to a uh, typical manufacturing company where your uh, SKU portfolio is maybe like less than 100 even, maybe like 100 to 200, right? Uh, in a supermarket, you have to keep number of varieties. You have to maintain uh, the product availability. So you will end up with number of large number of SKUs, right? Which is common. So now as the CFO, Mr. Pereira, uh, this, uh, his financial statement analysis, right? I know you are the experts of, you know, uh, analyzing financial statements than me, right? You know, you are working with certain financial ratios, right? So he, there, there's one particular financial ratio which took Mr. Pereira's interest, uh, which was the inventory turnover, right? Now for a supermarket, when you are managing 20,000 plus SKUs, ended up with an inventory uh, problem is, you know, often happens. So you have to be very careful, right? So now he identifies the problem. Now, this is something that you have to come up with, right? Like we discussed last week, you have your financial statements and then in, uh, you calculate your inventory turnover uh, year on year. So you can see uh, the inventory turnover in this case has in, uh, decreased from 15 to 11, right? That means number of times the, the your inventory get cleared during an year, right? Uh, so the inventory turnover has dropped from 15 to 11, right? Which is kind of alarming because you are keeping your inventory more than you expected, right? So on average, you used to keep in, in financial year 21, uh, you managed to uh, keep your inventory on average of 24 days. Now it has increased to 33 days, which is uh, three days over a month, right? So all your BI dashboard now in red. So your inventory dashboard, BI dashboard we now in red, right? So this is, this is where you use the BI, right? To trigger something. Right, that is that is uh, that is where you use business intelligence. So you calculate these simple formulas, uh, simple KPIs, and you monitor it continuously. Right. So let's assume that this supermarket has done their uh, all the hard work in terms of BI. So we know which level they are in in the uh, data science maturity index. Last week we discussed. So they are in the business monitoring phase. So they have managed to uh, identify their problem using their BI dashboard. Okay, so problem is clear now. Uh, 
inventory has increased or rather the slow moving inventory has increased right these current ratios are you know not looking great for the company okay so this is the problem that we are going to discuss today so this initiative could be anything any problem where you identify uh, an issue or an improvement opportunity Right. Last week, I remember most of you voted uh, to consider sales initiatives more than cost savings approach. Right, but unfortunately, at that point, I have fixed uh, and advertised that I am doing an inventory case study. Right, so I can't change my uh, use case. But we'll see. It's the same thing. If you want to say uh, you identify you wanted to increase your revenue, increase your sales, increase your customer footfall, uh, then that would be uh, your business initiative, right? Okay, I hope everybody understand what are we going to do today. So we have the problem. Now we are going to put that into our thinking like a data scientist process, right? So we discuss the concept related to this last week. But today we are going to take you through uh, step by step how you can dissect this uh, issue, right? And come up with a solution, right? Okay, right. So you know the problem now. I'm going to put this issue into uh, eight steps process, okay? You can see only uh, five, but there are totally eight steps. Uh, in our process, right? So let's go one by one, right? What's the uh, the first thing we need to do? Now you have identified the problem. Now we are discussing uh, with your top management, at your board, uh, at your manager's meeting, sales meeting, right? Uh, your finance uh, planning, budgeting meetings, depending on the initiative, right? but you have a very high level discussion about the problem or about the initiative that you have identified, right? Now there is a problem with inventory. Now the board decides they want to go back to their previous ratios, right? Which means you have to increase the inventory turnover from 11 to 15, which means your inventory days will decrease back to 24 days, right? So. Uh, by doing that, uh, they are trying to cut down their inventory, right? Cut down their inventory, right? That is one thing. If I go back, there is another uh, problem. Now, when Mr. Pereira analyzed the financial uh, ratios, he identified the inventory. But from the sales side, sales team is always complaining uh, last year, even though they have ended up with more inventory, last year, the customer dissatisfaction is also high, right? Because the sales team got a number of complaints uh, of product unavailability, right? Okay. And according to the sales team, these customers are the loyal customers. So, they do frequent um, shopping uh, at, at these outlets, right? And they have identified uh, they don't find the product that they are uh, looking for, right? So one hand, you have high inventories, right? On the other hand, service level has gone down. We can assume, I don't think... I, See, there is no sales KPI uh, here, but they have got a lot of complaints. So there's an assumption that service level has gone down, right? But inventory has gone up, right? So what does the board decide? Going back to uh, the inventory turnover numbers, previous inventory turnover numbers, right? But at the same time, you have to maintain 90% service level for your fast moving items, right? That means your high frequent, high volume uh, products, right? We'll discuss more about 
fast moving slow moving items right but you have to maintain a 90% uh, service level to service your uh, uh, loyal customers at the same time you have to uh, improve your inventory turnover and inventory days right now this is what we call a business initiative it matches matches all the definition of a business initiative right all of you are you know you are very good at you know uh, setting up business initiatives and what we call the smart objectives business goals right uh, so you know how uh, these things need to be set uh, but typically for data science and business uh, uh, big data initiative we say uh, a business initiative has to be something that you you are planning to implement you have taken a business decision to implement it within 9 to 12 months right so now in this case they are planning to uh, improve their inventory turnover and the uh, inventory days uh, within next 12 months so they are planning to go back to 2021 numbers right but at the same time they are going to maintain 90 percent service level for this year right now we have a business initiative clear right so anything if you want to start with a data science big data project try to find where the business requirement is right don't forget that don't skip that part make sure you had the right conversation with the top management leadership and make sure your data science or the big data initiative is aligned with your business objectives business goals business initiatives right otherwise you can't you know it's, it's no point then it what happens simply it becomes what we call that it experiment right okay so we have the business initiative now step one right so increase inventory turnover to 15 and thereby reduce the inventory days back to 24 in the coming 12 months while maintaining a minimum of 90 percent service level for fast moving items right this is something you can communicate cfo can communicate this business initiative to uh, the data science team or the the cross functional data science team that we discussed last week right okay now what's the second one this is where now uh, from of course the first one you have to put a lot of effort in terms of getting the uh, management buy in the leadership buy in right but the lot of work for you right not for the data scientist not for your data analyst for you most of the work starts from step two to step five okay so you have to pay uh, attention from step two to step five right this is where we need a lot of uh, support a lot of input from the business users right so what happens usually say even you identified an issue and you took a business initiative usually what happened right in a, in a typical uh, way the management calls uh, your data analyst maybe or if you have a data science team uh, or your uh, IT team most of the time right or your MIS team right and then they will say okay we have an inventory issue we want to go back to uh, our uh, previous uh, numbers uh, so do an analysis and come with the analysis right so that is not the way to do it right okay because the business initiative you can't directly uh, you know pass it to your data science team or the analytics team there are a lot of steps you need to do in between. Now, this business strategy or the business initiative, you have to translate it to a manner where your data science and technical team can understand and deliver a better analysis, deliver a better result. Okay, that is that is the important part, and that is your responsibility. 
right? Now, if this is a CFO initiative or a finance initiative, you are the one who understand the uh, issue. So you have to translate it, right? So this is where as non-technical uh, or non-data science or non-statistical uh, uh, people can get involved in the data science process, right? This is where you all can become data scientists. As I mentioned last week, there are a lot of uh, specific job opportunities uh, being created in this gap, right? To bridge this gap, right? Now we have data storytellers, right? Uh, we have business analyst, right? Okay, so there are a number of, um, we have data science uh, product managers, right? So number of uh, uh, different uh, uh, designation, different roles are created to bridge this gap, right? Between your business strategy or business initiative and the technical document or the technical requirement of the problem, right? There are a lot of uh, things to be done in between, right? This is where actually you can actively involve in the data science process as finance professionals, right? Okay, so the, this, this part, the second step, what we call stakeholder persona, right? Now, you know what persona is, right? Persona, or we can simply call it a profile uh, of a, a designation or of a, a job role, right? Now, in this case, what we do is, uh, now, any business strategy or any business initiative, uh, you will have uh, at least like three to five stakeholders who get impa uh, impacted, who get affected uh, by this business strategy, right? So now what we're trying to do is uh, we are trying to uh, implement or rather we are trying to reduce our inventory. We are trying to improve our inventory turnover and inventory uh, days, right? So in order to do that, uh, if we take that decision, if we are to implement that decision, there will be number of uh, stakeholders who get in, uh, affected, right? Now, for an example, the first person I have developed is the... Uh, demand planners person, right? There's a direct impact to all the decisions we take uh, in, in uh, reducing the inventory, right? Uh, demand planner will have to, you know, step in, right? To uh, implement this, right? So his day-to-day -day role, day-to-day -day decisions he takes will get affected uh, by our business initiative, right? So what you have to do is you have to identify these three things, right? So first thing you have to identify what's the demand planners overview, right? The average profile, right? Sometimes one company can have number of demand planners for different categories, especially for supermarkets, right? Uh, who does the category manage? Uh, or else there can be a demand planning team, right? Okay. So then you profile the average, uh, his uh, overview, right? Now, for an example, if we take a demand planner, uh, in this case, uh, he has three to five years experience in demand and supply planning. So his background is he's a mechanical engineer, right? Uh, so he's good with numbers and uh, he's good with analytics, right? So demand planner is good with numbers, good with analytical mindset. He has an engineering background and three to five years experience in demand and supply plan, right? Then you have to identify specially what are their pain points, right? This is where we can uh, connect because why we uh, do this uh, role by role is because ultimately at the end of the day, they have to take the decision to implement, right? Okay. So we have to support them through our data science and big data initiative, right? We are not planning to eliminate them, right? So data science and big data is more like 
uh, complementing the business decisions or the human decisions that we take, right? So the complete automation is a different sort of an approach, but data science and big data will, of course, it will automate where you don't need any strategic thinking, right? The routine task, you can, of course, automate it, right? Uh, but then uh, the, the, the human mindset needs to be uh, allowed to take more strategic level decisions, right? So that is the idea. So demand planner, if we identify their pain points, if we identify their day-to-day -day questions that they face, that will give us an idea, especially for the data science team, what sort of an output they need at the end. What sort of recommendations they need to implement or to support their decisions, day-to-day -day decisions, right? So this is where you need to, you know, put a lot of effort to capture their requirements, right? In terms of what we call the profile or the persona, right? Now, say for an example, with this current inventory situation, right? So the demand planner is responsible for demand forecasting, right? Running a demand forecast. Then the demand management process, that means uh, incorporating some qualitative uh, forecasting inputs could be from sales managers, uh, could be from brand managers, right? And then finally convert it into kind of a replenishment plan, right? So what, what are the pain points? For an example, in demand forecasting, high forecasting error when you have 20,000 plus SKUs in your portfolio, some of the items, especially slow moving items where you don't have a consistent demand are difficult to forecast, right? So the forecasting error of those items could be high, right? So what happens when the forecasting error is high, you tend to keep a lot of uh, safety stock or your buffer stocks level will increase, right? That will uh, result high number of slow moving inventory, right? Okay. And then when you have 20,000 plus SKUs, right? I'll come to the, the actual number of combination, right? For the, for, the, for, the, for the initial discussion, we'll take 20,000 items. So if the demand planner is forecasting 20,000 plus items, that means 20,000 plus different demand patterns, that's a very heavy load uh, for them to manage, right? And a heavy load for them to manage using conventional tools like an Excel sheet, right? Imagine having three years of monthly sales for 20,000 plus SKUs, maintaining in an Excel sheet, right? right? And uh, manually filling the forecast value for each SKU, right? That will be a hectic task, okay? Right? So in terms of demand management, now say this is a supermarket at uh, outlet levels or at regional levels or area level or category levels, the sales team will go ahead and plan a lot of promotional activities, which is common to drive sales, right? But the problem is if those promotional uh, campaigns, marketing campaigns, and especially, let's say there are local events, right? Say for an example, we'll take Candy Perahap, Asala Perahap, right? So that is a seasonal period uh, all the outlets around uh, candy, right? So those events, so there will be a lot of local events which has an impact to all these outlets, right? So if those events are only known to the outlet staff and the outlet manager and which is not communicated back to the central demand planning process or to the demand planner, those are not incorporated in the master demand plan. So, which means if you are unable to capture those, those ad hoc uh, peaks, ad hoc demand peaks, right? Basically, we are ignoring and we won't have enough stocks to manage the demand at that point, right? 
okay and replenishment plan what happens let's say if you have um, 20000 items usually it's common like you maintain a fix a flat percentage of uh, reorder level or a buffer stock for every item let's say you maintain 5% flat rate for every item as a buffer stock right that is a problem right so you need to customize your replenishment strategy for each and individual SKU, right? Not only SKU at, at different outlets, at different areas, at different categories, right? So you can understand how complex it becomes when you have a large number of SKUs to manage, right? So anything we have to do with inventory, definitely there will be a big impact on the demand plan. The decisions they take, the problems they face, Right. So the data science team and all the people who are involved in this business initiative has to first understand this. Right. Without knowing the problem, you can't solve it. Right. So you have to first understand where is the problem. Right. The root cause. Okay. Now, this is one. You have to develop personas for every person, every stakeholder involved. Right. That means not by name. Huh? by category or by type. So demand planner is one category, okay? So let's take another category, a store manager, right? So I took those two because those two are kind of, you know, uh, in two extreme levels, right? So uh, demand planner is trying to minimize the uh, uh, inventory and uh, the efficiency of the backend operation while store manager wants to sell more, right? Uh, so definitely you need to understand from their point of view, right? So if we do a kind of a siloed uh, activity just to develop demand planners persona and completely ignore the store manager, right? Uh, that means it definitely hinders your sales, right? Because he's the person who are actually at the ground level who plans sales activities, uh, promotion activities, right? He knows the local events. So they know how to plan it out, sell more, right? So you have to capture all these requirements, right? Especially the, the, uh, the contradicting uh, requirements, right? So that's why, say, for any initiative, you have to identify first maybe three to five uh, stakeholders, right? And develop their persona, especially to identify the key business question that they ask on daily basis to execute this uh, uh, strategy and the problems they face, right? This, you can understand at the end. So this is like you are planning the, the outcome, end result of this engagement, because at the end, they will have their own view to support their decision, right? But not in a siloed manner. All the data, all the analysis are integrated. What they see is different. Their user interface uh, or their user view is different, but they are all working on the same uh, objective at the end. So that is the idea, right? So this will give, if you have, if you prepare this properly, and you know, share it with your data science team, that will be ideal, right? That, that's kind of a lifesaver for the data science team because they are, don't understand this part of the business, right? Okay. Uh, so if we take for our business initiative, that is to uh, reduce inventory, uh, if we identify key uh, personas, so definitely sales managers, there could be category managers. In this case, in a supermarket, maybe category managers and demand planning goes hand in hand. So it could be the same profile. Then finance managers, right? What are your uh, pain points? What are your problems, right? Having a slow moving inventory, right? Uh, uh, your working capital get tied up, right? Uh, so all these finance managers persona. Right, how to finance the next replenishment order, right? This uh, your day-to-day -day activities, right? And it could be customers. In this case, uh, 
there is a service level issue, right? So we have to look at from the customer point of view. As a loyal customer, when they uh, step into an outlet to buy their usual average market basket, and some of the key items are not on the stock, then there's a problem, right? So we have to look at from their point of view as well. And suppliers, let's say uh, due to COVID, due to some economic decisions, due to uh, lockdown, your lead times could increase in a significant manner, right? So definitely we have to look at it from suppliers point of view, right? And probably a distribution center or the warehouse managers, right? So you have to develop personas of course, with uh, that is with a discussion, uh, discussion with these uh, stakeholders, right? But you have to document this. That is the ideal way to do this, right? Okay. Now we have covered two steps, right? Step number three. This part we call uh, identifying strategic nouns. So, what are these strategic nouns? And why these are important in a data science uh, process is this is where we identify what we call analytic profiles, right? So we build our analytical models, data analytical models around these strategic nouns, right? Now, in this case, for inventory, our strategic nouns would be uh, definitely product or in this case, SKU, right? We will be developing analytical models around SKUs, right? SKU movement, right? SKU value, the sales value, sales volume, uh, the uh, sales frequency, right? So th there will be a profile, analytical profile around SKUs. Right. Then, of course, inventory, inventory value, inventory volume, right? Inventory classification, which we are going to see how we are going to do it, right? Okay. So, inventory again a strategic noun, right? Then, of course, promotions, which has an impact on the uh, on the inventory, and of course, uh, the service level, right? So you have to capture promotions and events, right? So these are nouns where you need to collect more data about, right? All the data collection activity, all the analytical model building activities will be around these strategic nouns, right? So product, inventory, promotion, events, these are the key ones if you are working with inventory and the service level, right? Now, based on your, uh, let's say for an example, if your business initiate you is to increase the number of customers, right? So the customer, uh, the merchandising uh, campaigns, right? Uh, discounts and other allowances, so those, will be the nouns, strategic nouns in this case, right? So when you pass these strategic nouns to data science team, they understand that any analytical model that they have to build, right? And uh, any data collection process they have to undertake has to be around these uh, strategic nouns, right? Okay, so that is that is the uh, the important parts so, uh, data sources, data collection, analytics, analytical model buildings, and of course the recommendations. Right. So at the end, once you uh, come up with a solution, the solution has to recommend. Remember prescriptive analytics. Right. So the prescriptive part of it has to be the outcome. Uh, in a way of a recommendation, right? So those recommendations has to be around these strategic nouns, right? Okay, so clear with uh, these uh, three steps, right? 
first business initiative, then you are building stakeholder persona to identify pain points and questions, right? And then you identify strategic norms, right? Okay. Right. Then you have to put everything together, right? This, this actually, it's kind of uh, very uh, uh, difficult process, to be honest. You know what usually happens when you put your uh, operation team and uh, sales team together, right? Uh, so they have, you know, completely different views about uh, what they do and what they see, right? But this has to be done. Right. Otherwise, uh, if you skip this process, what happens is you will end up building individual siloed analytical models. Right. But those analytical models work individu individually on their own, but it won't provide the final result. Right. It won't come to that prescriptive mechanism to deliver results, right? That is, that is what happened, right? You can pass whatever you identify the strategic nouns and the personas uh, to the data science team. They will build, okay, they will build a statistical forecasting, very advanced statistical forecasting model for the demand plan, right? Uh, a very, um, you know, uh, predictive kind of a, a demand model to the store manager. Right, and for the warehouse or the uh, replenishment team, a separate optimization of inventory. Right, but they won't work together to deliver a final outcome, which is reducing inventory. Right, so that is why you have to identify these issues, not when you come up with data analytical models and uh, trying to implement it. You have to identify these problems. Uh, as early as possible, right? So that's why you have to put everyone into a single room, right? These are kind of, you know, goes as planning meetings or like uh, knowledge sharing sessions, right? Or brainstorming sessions, right? Everybody uh, has to provide their input, right? And what we need to do is now, during the uh, during developing uh, these uh, stakeholder personas, we identify individual stakeholders' pain points and key questions that they need to ask on daily basis, right? So you have to put all this together uh, at this stage, right? So your sales team also will be there your demand planning team, uh, logistic and supply chain team, warehousing team, store managers, right? So, and you, if you, what you have to do is amalgamate all the stakeholder personas, especially not the personas, the questions and the pain point. So you have to put those questions into a single table, right? There, you will identify some overlapping questions. Probably the same question is asked by multiple stakeholders, right? So you will identify those overlapping questions and also the contradicting questions. For an example, stakeholder, he tries to uh, improve the, sorry, uh, store manager tries to maintain a very high uh, service level, right? Keep the customers happy and try to drive sales through uh, promotions, marketing campaigns, right? Where the demand planning and the inventory management team will try to minimize inventory as much as possible, right? So those are contradicting weaves, right? So you have to put all these into a single weave and you know list down all the common uh, or rather the key questions or the business decisions that you need to take in order to reduce inventory, right? You have to always align with your business strategy, right? Because you can't 
you can't leave the, this to the data science team, right? It's not fair because we are not business professionals and we are not domain specialists, right? And when you ask, you know, when you just pass down the sales data and inventory data to us, you can't expect us to come up with, you know, everybody's solution, right? So you need to step in and try to simplify these questions as much as possible and then pass it to the technical team, right? So let's say in this case, we put all this, uh, stakeholder personas together, the key questions that they asked, right? And uh, the pain points, right? Okay. And then we have to simplify this as much as possible, right? Okay. Say for an example, now you, uh, once you collect all the stakeholder personas, you identify that everybody is working with their own forecast, right? This is very common, right? I think you have more experience than me uh, in an organization, let's say a sales team, they have very aggressive sort of a sales target oriented, incentive oriented forecast, maybe based on value, most probably, right? At the same time, the demand planning team and uh, the operational team, they do a forecast by volume. Probably they use some statistical methodologies to arrive at a number. And their uh, forecast is somewhat you know, defensive. They try to keep inventory as low as possible, right? So they are coming up with, a, they are working on the replenishment and the supply chain working on a different uh, forecasting value, right? Then probably your finance team, right? You, you do an annual budget and a planning, and then um, you do a very high level, very aggregated level uh, forecast, which you are focusing on, and then which you are working on that, right? So that is of course an issue, right? So if you want to solve this, you have to amalgamate these different forecasting models into a single forecast, single forecasting number, right? That means for a specific SKU for a given item, you should maintain a single forecast value across the supply chain, right? Okay, across the supply chain. So that means at the end, you will have different views, right? finance team will see the, the sales value or the, the cost of inventory. Then the sales team will look at the sales value. Uh, supply chain team or the inventory team will look at the uh, sales volume or the inventory volume, right? But they are working on the sing same single forecasting value, right? Okay, so that should that is ideal, right? Then, for the same thing, you have to incorporate any qualitative um, or rather external factors, for an example, promotions and events, right? Okay, so in order to incorporate those ad hoc demands into the forecast, your inventory planning has to be dynamic, right? Okay, you can't keep static inventory planning like, you know, flat 5% across every SKU as a, a buffer stock, or your reorder level is 25% of uh, the sales value, or rather sales volume, right? So you can't do flat percentages, uh, flat formulas uh, to facilitate the service level and reducing in it, right? So your energy planning has to be dynamic, right? It's very difficult to do it for 20,000 SKUs. That is where we have a solution, right? Okay, so we are not discussing about management solutions here. We are discussing about a technical solution, but you have to understand these requirements, right? Okay, and at the same time, you have to maximize the service level, right? Now, all these different uh, uses, uh, your demand planner, your store manager, sales manager, finance manager, 
all these different stakeholders should agree and validate these final questions that you need to find answers. Right? Okay. This is something that's why I again and again highlighted last week. This has to be a cross functional approach. Right? If you remember, this is not hippo, this is cross functional collaboration. Right? If you don't do this, you will end up with a very nice looking uh, analytical formula, even the most advanced machine learning or the deep learning uh, algorithm, right? But whatever comes out of it, you can't implement, you can't execute because you haven't covered everybody's view. You haven't identified their different views and you know amalgamate everything into a single uh, sort of simple questions. Right. Okay. So these, that's why, I, see, that's why you have, uh, you know, a, a large responsibility when it comes to a data science uh, and big data initiative. Right. It's not the technical part. This requirement part has to be addressed first. If you want to actually implement and see the results. That means you are going from business insights. Business insights can be delivered, right? Data science teams are very good at that, right? Predicting, predictive modeling, giving you uh, forecast, right? Giving you predictions with very high statistical accuracy levels. We can do that, right? So business insights will be there, but you are not optimizing your business. Remember the, the top layer, so we came from business monitoring to business insights to business optimization. So monitoring and insights can be done without any issue, right? But there's no outcome, there's no output. You won't see any results, you won't see ROI, right? That is the problem right now, that is the problem. A lot of businesses, they have invested on data science and big data technologies. They have recruited um, their own teams. They, they have built in-house teams to do that, right? But the ROI is not, not something visible right now, okay? I'm not talking about the leading companies, right? Talking about in general, right? So, so that in order to realize ROI, now business monitoring and insight phase, the problem is you are investing so much on the technology and people and skill, but you can't see result because whatever the insights coming out of the analytical models doesn't get implemented. In order to implement it, you have to convert it to prescriptive models. And that is what we call the business optimization layer, right? So, so that, that is the important part. Right. So if you are in the business optimizing layer, you can actually convert your analytical result directly into rupees and cents. Your ROI is visible. In the inside phase, it's very difficult because I have done the siloed data science projects where I go and sit with the demand planner and I improve the forecasting accuracy the statistical accuracy, right, in a significant manner and give them an ideal uh, kind of a forecasting model, right? So the demand planner is happy, but the, the ultimate goal of reducing inventory and show the management that we managed to reduce uh, this much of inventory value, right, by keeping the service level, that entire process, is not there, right? So in order to get that, that's why I keep highlighting it. Uh, it has to be a collaborative approach, right? Okay, so our inventory reduction business strategy got finally summarized into these four major business decisions, right? Validated by all the 
statement. We have to come up with a single forecasting model, a central forecasting method, right? And everybody, each stakeholder has to work on that single forecasting value across the organization, across the supply chain, right? And then the promotion events, which happens at the ground level has to be communicated, right? To that forecasting model, right? Could be based on, uh, we'll discuss how we can collect those data, right? And then no fixed or flat inventory planning. The inventory planning has to be dynamic, right? And ultimately, uh, the prescriptive part, the recommendation should come uh, in order to maximize the service length, right? So this is something that data science team can, you know, get some sense. They can, you know, immediately they see this, they can, you know, plug with the different data analytical models, right? Predictive models, prescriptive models, they can work with the uh, technological part, right? And then now these simple questions, we are converting into this type. This we know, right? Last week we discussed, right? We discussed. Uh, identifying descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive questions. So we are categorizing or we are um, drill down those high level simple questions into more detailed, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive type questions, right? Say, let's take uh, our first one that is coming up with a single uh, forecast, right? So then a descriptive analytical model, right, uh, would be last month forecasting error. I didn't say sales because that's a reporting type, right? So we can be a bit more advanced at this phase, right? So you have to identify where the problem is. Now we know high number of SKUs has resulted high forecasting error, especially for slow moving items. So you have to decide rather just, you know, reading through the historical sales, what you need to understand is what was my last month forecasting error for product A at Outlet X, right? That is the drill down. That is type of a descriptive question you should be asking, which we should find answers, right? Okay. And then the predictive part will be uh, forecasting next month's uh, sales, right? Then how we can incorporate promotions and events, right? So we can see historically, we can find the relationship. So we do kind of a diagnostic uh, analysis to identify each event or each promotional campaign, what is the percentage of sales increase due to that promotional campaign. So there are, there are different uh, analytical models to do that, right? You can't just take the, the, uh, the PO percentage increase, right? You have to have an evolution period for a promotional campaign and for that particular event. And during that, you have to take the actual impact of that promotional campaign. Because as a promotional campaign, if you like give a 10% discount, Obviously, the sales volume will go up, right? But then you have to evaluate it after the promotional period. What's the true impact of that promotional campaign, right? Those are, you know, technical analysis, analytical models. Then, uh, so based on that, you can build a predictive model. If you plan a promotional campaign like this, based on our previous or historical performance, you will get this much of additional sales. So that 
additional sales has to get incorporated into our base forecast, which then converted into our inventory model, which then decides how much to order, when to order, right? And where to order, right? Then uh, the slow moving inventory items, right? What was my slow moving inventory portfolio uh, last year or last quarter, right? And the predictive part would be for the coming quarter, for the coming year, what would be my best case, worst case, and average case slow moving inventory profile, right? Then let's take service level. So we are checking for, let's say, for perishable items. We'll take a category, we'll kind of aggregate it because you can't uh, check individual SKU service level all the time, right? Let's, if we just aggregate it to a little bit. So these are the things, these are the decisions that you have to take at this uh, step and this step, data science team, the technical team will start, you know, stepping in because they can provide more input at this level, right? Because they know the business requirement now, when you drill down into these specific questions, they can add more value, right? So identifying the descriptive, predictive, and the prescriptive part, now that technical team can step up, right? So you they will do a kind of a detailed exercise, right? But the, each of these questions has to get validated again by you and the users, stakeholders, right? Uh, let's say the service level, they, we decide that we do it by category, right? Or maybe subcategory level. Uh, so what was your average service level for category P last year, right? <coughs> You can maybe use different data sources for this, right? Uh, maybe the number of customer complaints, uh, maybe the maybe your e-commerce uh, uh, sector, e-commerce data, right? Anything. Uh, then uh, the predictive part, uh, the predicted buffer stock that you need to maintain because buffer stock you have to maintain based on your uh, forecasting error, right? So forecasting error is one. Uh, based on that, you have to decide how much to maintain, right? How much buffer stock to maintain. So you do kind of a predictive model there, uh, how much uh, buffer stock you need to maintain 90% service level, right? So everything you can uh, basically identify individual prescriptive models also, right? That is the actual next step, but rather everything should finally build a prescriptive model or a business optimization model, right? Kind of a recommendation system to answer this question, right? What is the optimum reorder volume for each item level, category level, at the outlet level, right? Uh, to increase the inventory turnover, right? Back to 15, thereby reduce the inventory days back to 24, right? While maintaining 90% service level for the fast moving items, right? So if we summarize this descriptive predictive into a single question, right? Single kind of a model output, this is the one, right? You can individually build your prescriptive analytical models, right? But finally, everything has to collectively uh, work towards answering this question, right? So we are finally building a recommendation model or a optimizing model, optimization model, right? To answer how much order, when and where, right? Okay, so these first five steps understand small business than technical, right? But without these 
five steps. You can't really uh, initiate a successful data science or a big data uh, project, right? You can do, you can do, but you don't need any ROI, right? It's really difficult, right? Because if you try to answer these questions uh, without kind of having a final uh, goal in mind, then those will be individual uh, analytical models, right? You will have dashboards, you will have uh, nice looking forecasting models, uh, high level of statistical accuracies, but what happens at the end? That should be the end goal, right? So everything should develop into recommendations, uh, optimization system, answer this question, right? Okay. Right. So I hope you understand the first five steps, right? Uh, so if you have any questions, what I need you to do is, you know, you can uh, apply this to whatever the initiative that's there in your mind right now, right? Could be, as most of you said last week, it could be a sales uh, initiative, right? Increasing your sales, product, customer, or market, right? Or else any cost saving or anything operation, maybe debt collection, right? Something like that. Any business initiative. So you go through these five steps, right? Now, finally, what we build here, right? This can be considered as kind of the official requirements for this data science and big data initiative, right? So this is what the technical team has to work for. Now, once they are here, now after this, data scientists will provide more input, right? Uh, next two steps, I would say. Data scientists would uh, provide more input, right? But up, up to these five steps, stakeholders, business users, you, and business analysts, data science or data storytellers, those are the uh, ones who drive this, right? So data science team is there, right? They need to see this from the beginning, but uh, the users, they have to drive this first five steps, right? Okay, right. Okay, then what happened? Then there are three, uh, steps, right? So I told you this is an eight step process, thinking like a data scientist, right? So th this slowly co get converted into data science or analytical models, right? The questions, the descriptive, predictive and prescriptive questions we identified, then get converted into uh, technical or analytical models. Right. So this first step, what we call by analysis, right? Okay. B by by analysis, right? Not any other by. Uh, so by analysis, uh, this is very important, right? Remember the strategic noun we discuss at uh, step three, step number three, right? product, inventory, customer, uh, promotional campaigns, events, right? We identify those strategic nouns. Now in bioanalysis, we start collecting data about these strategic nouns, right? So data science team will start collecting data, right? And this part, uh, we have to be innovative as much as possible, 
right? That is where the big data component comes, right? In bioanalysis, what we do is um, all those descriptive, predictive, uh, and prescriptive questions, we expand it into this format, right? Uh, this structure, I want to, there has to be a verb, then a matrix, right? Or any other value, right? So this, this is where you have to be innovative, especially the data science team uh, has to be innovative, right? A verb, a matrix, and the by clause, then an attribute, right? So what happens usually here, this verb could be anything related to descriptive, predictive, or prescriptive nature, right? So if you say, I want to be, I want to monitor, I want to report, that means it's descriptive in nature, right? If you say, I want to forecast, I want to predict, I want to simulate, then it becomes predictive in nature. Right? Then if you say, I want to optimize, I want to minimize, I want to maximize, right? Then that is prescriptive, right? So verb is based on the type of the analytical model that you want to build, right? So this, this statement will get converted into an analytical model, right? That is the idea, right? So verbs are something like this could be descriptive, predictive, or prescriptive, right? Then the matrix, right? Matrix, you can be innovative as much as possible, right? I'll come to that. I'll show you, especially how to incorporate or convert uh, not this row level data, row level value. You can convert it to a nice looking score, a nice looking matrix, right? So now matrix is the value you are looking at. Could be the sales value, could be the forecast, next month forecast, right? My current inventory, my average inventory, right? My current service level, forecasted service level, best case service level, worst case service level, right? Then uh, the promotional campaign, expected outcomes, right? Event demands buffer stock, right? Now, rather using uh, the raw value of sales or raw value of forecast, right? You can be innovative at this stage, right? But then convert it into a scope, which is the next step, right? So this is where any metric, any value comes, right? And this is where you collect attributes about these values, about this matrix as much as possible, right? This is where you can use big data, innovative data sources, right? Instead of usual, uh, let's say product, you have your category, brand, and uh, uh, maybe a subcategory, right? Let's say personal care, uh, then, uh, hair products uh, and any brand, right? Unilever or something, any brand, right? So that is in your item master, right? So maximum like three, four, five maximum categories, you will find maximum attributes uh, in your item master. But if you be more innovative, if you tap into big data, right? You can come up with, let's say, a popular score based on social media post and like for that particular product, right? Customer reviews and customer complaints about this product, right? Where you collect from Google, you know, collect from other social media, right? You collect from review and rating websites third party market research, right? And then maybe let's say there is a health conscious part of, to it, then uh, certain attributes about that, 
right? The content, the number of calories if it is a food diet, you collect from innovative data sources rather than, you know, structured into your predefined attributes. You look beyond that and identify innovative big data, unstructured data sources to collect more attributes, right? So this is where data engineering team can come in, uh, data scientists can step in, right? And your IT team and uh, your marketing team, right? They can step in and provide more innovative matrix, more innovative attributes to identify your behavior, right? This is because say handling 20,000 SKU is not easy. Forecasting 20,000 SKUs is not easy with the conventional view, right? When you have only the uh, product category, subcategory, and, and a brand, right? You need more data. So here you can be innovative as much as possible. You ask all these questions, right? I want to uh, weave the uh, sales by uh, popularity, right? By number of customer contacts, right? At the same time, you have your traditional hierarchy as well, your traditional sales hierarchy. You have your outlets, then cluster of outlets in an area becomes a group, then maybe regional, uh, then at the national level, right? Maybe you have separate uh, outlet classification based on the sales value they do, right? Uh, then your product uh, hierarchy, that is your product SKU, category, subcategory, brand, right? So those are in your item master, customer master, sales master files, internal, right? But if you go beyond that, right? You can ask all sort of questions, right? So in this by analysis, you can, uh, you know, imagine and you know be innovative and identify a lot of analytical models, right? Especially matrix by different attributes, right? Okay. So you list down all these questions, right? Maybe some of the uh, uh, attributes, capturing those attributes require a lot of investment. Maybe you need to build a web scraping bot, uh, which probably cost you more, right? But here we are not considering the inf uh, implementation feasibility much. We are just trying to ask the important questions as much as possible, right? Then when it comes to implementation, we look at the feasibility. We'll come to that, right, at the end. But this is where you can ask all these questions, right? Okay. Now, the data, if you have done all these steps, now your data science team is probably very happy, right? They know exactly what to do, right? And then you go ahead and convert these matrix or values, this part, right? Including the attributes, but especially these values, rather, you know, individually measuring sales, individually measuring forecast, inventory volume, inventory value, you try to create what we call scores, right? These are actually uh, matrix, right? Matrix that you measure, right? Now, in uh, since we are in the inventory uh, reduction process, right? So some of these scores are like this. You can amalgamate sales and inventory together and do a classification. We call it ABC classification, right? I'll show you, right? ABC classification. Then now you have your promotional uh, event uh, forecast comes through sort of a qualitative input from your ground level staff, ground level sales staff, right? Or the store managers. Now, how you incorporate that into a statistical forecast, you can create a score, what we call forecast value added, FVA, right? Okay, 
then you have your usual scores as well, like for an example, statistical forecasting error, right? Then minimum, maximum inventory level. That also is amalgamated to the forecast, uh, forecasting model. So when you change the forecasting model based on the error and the other forecasting parameters like lead time and the service level, min max inventory levels has to change. It dynamically changes the scope. Right? So that is how you create score. Rather, you know, trying to uh, uh, measure these row values, right? And service level and dynamic reorder level. So you convert everything. Now, these are actually analytical models, right? These are analytical models. But when you create analytical model, this is actually data science team has to put more input here because they are the one who are familiar with these uh, models, right? The uh, analytical part, right? But when we create these scores, what happened? Those different uh, stakeholders or different uh, questions we ask comes together, right? So I'll, I'll show you one example, right? So let's talk about this ABC uh, classification, right? So in ABC classification, what happens simply, let me show you with an example. I think that that is better, right? So let me quickly, show you kind of a working example, right? So I have this, don't uh, worry about the V if you see, right? So I'm in R now, okay? I'm in an R environment, uh, but this data set, okay, this is a kind of an actual data set, but I have changed the values, right? Uh, so this is actually a supermarket uh, data set, right? Uh, but let me let me summarize it for you. Uh, now this has for each item, right? This is row level data, okay? With some sort of amalgamation. For given item, given SKU, this has sales volume, right? How much sales has happened? Let's say uh, last month, right? Uh, how much sales has happened? Sales value, right? Uh, sorry, I don't think sales value is there. Uh, what's the current inventory of this particular scale, right? So inventory value and inventory volume, okay? So we have the sales volume, inventory volume and value, right? Now, what happened when we do uh, an ABC analysis, right? Now, usually I know some of you are familiar with ABC analysis. What you do is you implement this fixed 80 20 rule uh, into this, right? So, what you do is if you are doing it in Excel, uh, you get the sales, right? Probably one year sales, total sales, right? And you order it in descending order, highest to the lowest. Then you calculate the cumulative sales percentage and where it comes to around 80% and above, you identify as uh, A category items. That is your 80%. SKUs which deliver 80% of your sales, right? Then you get another 15% cumulative uh, sales percentage and then you call them B category items, right? Then the last bottom 5%, you consider C category items. So what happens usually 20% of your SKUs deliver 80% of your sales. 
right? Twenty percent of your SKUs deliver. That means if you have hundred SKUs in your SKU portfolio, twenty SKUs will deliver eighty percent of your sales, right? Okay. So then next, uh, fifteen percent B B category items, right? Sorry, uh, uh, another uh, twenty five percent will deliver another fifteen percent of your sales. Those are the B category items, right? Okay. But 60 to 65 percent of your SKU portfolio items will deliver only five percent of sales, right? That is the rule of thumb, right? But when it comes to data science, we can improve this matrix, right? Instead of going rule of thumb, now the problem with rule of thumb is your 80th percentile and the 81st percentile, if you look at those two items, the sales volume is same, probably the same, right? So those two items are supposed to be in the same classification. But what you do, since you are fixing it at 80% cumulative, you get 80th percentile item as a, a category item, 81st percentile item as B category item. So you treat them differently, but the behavior is same, right? They have done almost same number of sales. So there, there is an error in your typical ABC analysis. So when you give that to the data science team, what they do is they introduce uh, a statistical method to calculate this. If you can see, I hope you can see the uh, screen, right? So if you look at the uh, bottom right, you can see uh, it introduce, it's kind of a, it's not complex, actually, it's the same graph, but these uh, thresholds will dynamically change. It's not 80% fixed and 85% fixed. Uh, it di dynamically changes. Now, in this case, if you look at, I think it's uh, very close to 80 20 rule, but little different, right? So, the A category items, that is 17% of your SKUs, deliver 79% of your sales, right? Okay. So, in when you use a statistical distribution to fit the curve, it will identify the correct threshold, correct point. So, if you actually look at it, the seven, uh, 79th percentile and the 80th percentile has a big significant difference right? Significant difference in the behavior. So you are identifying, you're classifying it correctly, right? Not by rule of thumb, right? Okay. So that is where the statistical modeling algorithm, machine learning algorithms, other exploratory analytical models, clustering, all these, these uh, various names that you have heard, those comes in here. Right, which data scientists are good at. Right, so these models are statistically accurate. Right, so you are converting your business strategy into a quantitative models, quantitative scores at this base. Right, and if you go furthermore, now ABC analysis you do based on sales volume. Right, since this is an inventory reduction. If you want to re re uh, reduce inventory, you have to do it by physical items, right? By volume. Value will reduce as a result, right? But you have to first reduce the volume, right? So you do this ABC analysis by uh, sales volume, right? And then what you have to do, this is not, this is just the analysis, right? But when you convert into a score, what will happen, right? you develop something like this, right? Now, if you can see this, here what I have done is, I've got the sales ABC analysis, right? Okay, so you can see 79% uh, uh, of sales, right? 
this is 7% of sales, B category items, C category items, 13% sales, right? Now, in when you convert it into a score, you combine it with your current inventory profile. So you, if you plot, if you combine it with inventory, right? This is your inventory. That is now how you interpret this. In order to do 79% of sales, right? You are maintaining 80% of your inventory, right? This is actually not the real data. This is after an optimization, right? Real story I have seen crazy looking ABC diagrams, right? Okay. Some see when it comes to different industries, this norm has to change, right? For an example, electronic items, right? The ABC analysis is A category is only 5% of your SKUs will deliver sometimes 90 to 95% of sales by volume, huh? by volume. Okay. In electronic uh, sector, right? So C category is basically 95% of your SKUs, right? Which is closely seven to five, eight uh, percent of your sales. Sometimes five percent of your sales, right? But in terms of value, it's different because a lot of slow moving items are high value items, right? Okay, so that's why. Uh, so you combine. Now you can see it here also, right? Now this is the inventory volume, the second bar, right? Top bar is sales, sales ABC, which we did. So. Uh, in order to do 79% of your sales, you maintain 80% of your inventory, right? Okay. And that inventory cost is close to 60% of your inventory value. That is inventory by value, right? That is inventory by value. Okay. So you can see if you look at the C category, in order to do 13% uh, sales, you maintain 13% of inventory, but in terms of value, it's roughly 19%, right? Okay, so slow moving, high value items could cost this, right? Now in a supermarket, it's very minimum, right? And this is after an optimization also, right? But the actual case, you will try to do it if you have an inventory problem, right? If you want more details, I'll, of course, support you. Uh, but you will see like crazy looking inventory profiles. If you do, if you apply fix 80 to 20 rule, this, you won't see this, right? Okay. Now, this is a nice looking score. You can connect a lot of things, right? You can improve this score, which will give you at a glance, it will show you this can use for all three type of analysis, analysis. So descriptive is this. If you do this for your current inventory profile, you will see as it is, what is my current inventory classification? How much inventory I maintain to uh, facilitate only 5% of my sales, right? If it is more than, let's say, 30, 40% of your inventory, then there is your problem, right? Okay, that is descriptive part. Predictive, you can convert this into a simulation model. What you can do is, if you combine this with the statistical forecasting model, right? The forecasting output, and forecasting output based on the forecasting output, forecasting error, and the service level, and the lead time, you create your uh, reorder or the replenishment strategy, right? That is your reorder levels and reorder quantities. Based on that, you maintain the inventory strategy. Let's say a dynamic min-max inventory strategy, right? Especially for like, you know, uh, this dynamic ad hoc uh, demand products, right? So. If you build that model, that is that is the simulation model. So if you run those simulation, you can see how what will happen to your C category, B category, and A category inventory. Right? 
this can be this model can be used as a predictive it's kind of a simulation model so you will see what what is your uh, worst case scenario and uh, the ideal situation or the best case scenario and an average case scenario you can run simulation multiple simulations on this model right and then based on those simulation you can optimize right and in order to maintain your 50 uh, inventory uh, inventory turnover at 15 right you will realize how much you need to reduce in your c category inventory right so this this is what we call you know if you just get the row level sales value you can't do this right building individual analytical models when you combine it and create a score, that score has to be something like this. Now, this connects sales and inventory. One of you know most contradicting uh, questions we asked or contradicting decisions that we had to take: service level versus uh, uh, inventory cost. Right now, if you combine this and this analytical model, we can take to the descriptive, to predictive, to prescriptive, right? That will give you the inventory strategy exactly to maintain, right? I mean, this is just the overall visualization, but you understand this, every item will have a classification, whether it's an A category item, B category item, or C category item, right? So based on that, you calculate all the replenishment parameters, inventory levels, min max levels, everything. Right? Okay. So now you can see when we came through these seven steps, our initial business strategy we have converted into a score, a quantifiable score, which we can at the end optimize. Right? Okay, okay. So let's let's take another uh, uh, score, right? Uh, we call this forecasting value added, right? Now this comes because I told you. Uh, now this this is a very uh, interesting topic, and it, I mean I have done separate session uh, training sessions just to uh, explain this. Uh, forecasting value added matrix, right? It's it's a broad area, but I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. So now we agreed in our uh, business initiative to maintain a single forecasting model, right? That means a shared, uh, a single forecasting value shared by everyone across the organization, right? So how you execute that, how you make sure that happens, right? Now, when you introduce a statistical forecasting model, statistical forecasting model, data scientists will tell you the most advanced statistical models, which Facebook and Google does right now, Amazon does, right? All are available, right? Okay, I just have to call a library in my R environment just to implement that. It's easy, right? It's very easy, trust me, it's very easy, right? So that is not the problem, okay? Now the problem is we know now we need some qualitative inputs. So whatever our base forecast will get override by those uh, external qualitative inputs. Like the best view is with the ground level staff, right? With the ground level staff. So we have to allow, let's say we came up with a very advanced statistical forecasting model, which actually improves uh, our forecasting accuracy because forecasting accuracy has a direct impact to our inventory levels, right? So let's say we came up with a forecasting model. Let me show you quickly another example.
right? So let's say you uh, came up with a statistical forecasting model, right? Which improves the accuracy significantly. But still, you have to incorporate those qualitative inputs coming from your sales team, uh, branding team, product team, right? Uh, category managers, maybe like from different uh, different uh, areas, right? So then what you can do is allow a manual override on top of your base statistical forecasting model, right? So a qualitative uh, override is possible. Right. So say for an example, something like this. Right. So now say for an example for a particular category, right? Now this will give a nice looking statistical forecast. You can see uh, the MAP value, mean absolute percentage error, right? Those are statistical scores, right? Don't worry, data scientists will take care of those, right? So MAP is 11%. That means this is roughly 89% uh, accuracy, accuracy. Statistical accuracy is there, right? So you come up with this, but then there is a promotional campaign plan for this particular product, okay? So then the sales manager can override this, but this override value get recorded in our forecasting analytical model and get incorporated and get uh, stored in our final forecasting value, right? Okay, so we have additional, maybe there, there could be another layer. So maybe sales for uh, sales uh, override, there could be a product override or marketing override, things like that, right? But it has to get recorded, right? Now, how you optimize this over the time is ideally we have to minimize the forecasting error as much as possible, right? So this is where rather now measuring individual statistical accuracies, you can use what we call this forecasting, forecast value added matrix, right? What this does is now we know statistical accuracy is 89%, error is only 11%, right? Now, if there was a sales forecast, manual override happened, qualitative input happen next month or when the next uh, demand planning cycle comes, you evaluate which level provided the highest forecasting value in terms of the accuracy. Say now for an example, this we know statistical uh, error is only 11%, right? Now overwrite, the error is 50%, right? No offense, sometimes, I mean, that's why we implement the statistical forecast, right? Get a significant improvement in the forecasting error. So uh, sometimes override will have higher level of accuracy, right? But in this case, unfortunately, override accuracy is only 50%, right? After you measure, this is, let's say, last month, right? So now that means compared to the override, compared to the manual override, statistical forecasting has created 65.84% of forecast value added. Understand, right? Okay, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. 39%, sorry, this is against naive, right? I'm not going to explain that. Naive is uh, this month's forecast is ne next month's sales, next month, sorry. Previous month, actual, right? Naive is the uh, basic or the most fundamental forecast you can come up with. This month sales forecast is previous month's actual. You are not forecasting actual. You are just assigning the same value. So forget about naive. Let's say let's compare statistical versus override. So statistical accuracy is eighty nine percent. Override accuracy is only 5%. So statistical model, our base statistical model has 39% value addition to the forecasting accuracy, right? So you create this matrix over the period, you can optimize your forecasting accuracy. You can identify non-value adding forecasting methods 
could be the statistical model or it could be the uh, manual overrides. So if one override level continuously performing poorly over the time, doesn't add any forecast in value, you can get rid of that because other uh, forecasting methods add more value to the forecast, right? You can see when you convert this into a score, it, you can use that through the descriptive. So if it is descriptive, it's this. This is last month FEA matrix. And we can clearly say last month, our statistical forecasting model has performed really well compared to manual overrides. Right? You can even monitor multiple statistical models using FEA, but don't spend too much time on you know, putting all the statistical models into a free and matrix doesn't work well. So, you know, unnecessary uh, thing to do, right? But if you are con comparing qualitative versus statistical forecasting models, then you can clearly see the difference, right? And the same thing you can use uh, for a simulation model. What will happen if my forecasting accuracy dropped by 5%? then it will gives um, it will increase the forecasting error forecasting error has a direct impact to calculate my min max inventory levels so thereby the buffer stock will increase you can simulate right and over the period this will i mean you don't have to run any modules or run any analytical models over the time, you will understand as a management decision which level of forecasting has the highest accuracy level. Right? So these scores are important, right? And you can be very innovative in this step six and seven uh, by incorporating a lot of innovative and uh, high impact like important scores into this uh, initiative, right? Each score you can see has a direct impact. Like it's like we have converted our strategy into a quantifiable score, right? These are not these typical KPIs that KPI and performance matrix you create just to monitor your performance. These can use as predictive and prescriptive models. So this score itself is an analytical model, right? And the data science technical team's responsibility is to deliver these with the highest accuracy, right? And with the statistical validation, right? That is, those are things that they are good at, right? You can do the business validation part for these scores, right? You have to interpret this uh, to incorporate into your business decisions, right? Okay, so these scores, I mean, I can come up with like two, three more scores if this is actually the, um, the main project, I would add two or three uh, more uh, scores like this, right? These are not just, you know, creating pie chart, creating a simple bar chart, and you put it into a dashboard. These you can interpret into your business initiative, right? That's a big difference. That's why I'm saying this is not BI, this is data science, right? Okay. So let me go back to my uh, presentation. Right. And then, uh, finally, what we do is putting these things into action, right? So the ideal thing to do is once you come up with, see, uh, even creating scores and uh, by analysis, there will be a lot of 
you know data science you can't consider as a sequential process okay it's an iterative process this is more agile and it has to be more flexible than a typical bi dashboard development process which is very sequential you you know one step another step right and finally you deliver the dashboard but these especially these um, uh, steps six seven and eight especially six and seven there will be a lot of um, iterative uh, movements right there has to be a feedback loop right data scientists will do exploratory analysis like abc classification and uh, various other clustering models and they will come up with different scores different analytical models and then you have to validate it in terms of the business strategy and the business requirement right so there will be a lot of uh, iterations in this process right and that is important to come up with a very good uh, analytical models right which actually serve your purpose right so think data science process as very you know agile uh, practice i know agile is like everybody is talking about agile now but this is act actually you can't you know be very sequential best thing to do is when you come to this six seven uh, steps uh, what i do is as the data science team i try to deliver something as soon as possible right so then we can start the start that feedback loop with the business users right and then improve those scores or maybe change scores come up with new scores right so you can do that right so that is how you have to uh, work on that right so when you try to finally come to the implementation uh, best thing is all these by analysis and finally the scores you created has to be documented and this will be the official uh, kind of uh, model document not the technical document but the model uh, document analytical model document we call these recommendations worksheet right every score that we come up with has to be you know has to connect to our final prescriptive question that we try to answer right so that you can prepare it in a maybe in a uh, excel sheet or right right now these work boards and all these uh, scrum sort of practices are common uh, so you can uh, do a kind of a to do matrix something like that right and then the implementation team data uh, science team will work on that right okay so this is how you can uh, involve in the data science and big data project and finally deliver what your business wants to achieve right okay so this eight steps process we call it uh, thinking like a data science scientist process right so you can see now you don't want you don't have to learn or you don't have to become a data scientist in order to involve in this initiative because the first five steps has to be run by you right okay so as finance professionals as accountants you can get to know and when, when it comes to the technical part when you uh, associate uh, with the technical part you will eventually learn what sort of areas that you want to look in right rather you know think that you need to learn machine learning algorithms at the beginning or you want to start coding in python to look, become a data scientist start with right now what you are doing right now right your current job profile right unless you want to change your career and you know become a hardcore data scientist then of course it's possible right uh, but if you are trying to start an initiative within your organization within your role you can follow through these uh, steps right so you don't have to be technical but when it came to the technical 
it's always good to try to understand that technical part, right? Then try to understand time series, how you can create a time series, how you can uh, do certain classifications. Maybe you can start learning R or Python, but uh, for finance professionals, I recommend R because for you, it will be easier, right? Okay. Uh, so then you can start and then you know exactly scores that you want to deliver, right? So you will start with that. Rather, you know, try with all the advanced deep learning neural networks. You can start with a simple classification or simple clustering program, right? Then you can build on that, right? Okay. Now, then I have a small part. Uh, now we know what to deliver, right? So the data science team can work on that. But then there comes certain restrictions, right? So we be, I ask you to be innovative as possible when you try to do the buy analysis and come up with uh, scores. Try to capture various different uh, big data and untapped innovative data source, right? But when it comes to implementation, actual implementation, there could be restrictions, right? So how you can solve this? Easy. Easy two steps, right? We have uh, actually again another scope, right? So let's go through the same approach, right? First, we do two analysis. Now, this is where your IT team, data engineers has to be, <clears throat> has to be in, right? It's better if you can participate them from the beginning itself, right? But this is where their input will have a lot of um, uh, value, right? When it comes to the actual implementation, because all this data now we have to co uh, collect. So we, we may have to connect to different data sources, right? Third party data sources, web, different APIs, and internally you have your own IT policies, right? Uh, different uh, data privacy laws, different territories, IT security, cyber security issues, right? A lot of things, right? So all the data sources that you identified may not be feasible when it comes to implementation. So you do two quick steps, right? This will take time, but including your data science team users and especially your IT and the technical team, right? First, we create a value matrix, right? Now, when you do this, try to, you know, it, it's better that if this can become a kind of organization-wide approach, because now we went through reducing inventory path, right? That was our business initiative. But at the same time, parallel, there will be multiple business initiatives, right? Say for an example, reducing inventory is something you identify. But at the same time, sales and distribution team, they identify they want to decrease the cost to serve, right? Sales and distribution cost, right? And maybe the newly formed uh, your e-commerce division, they want to increase e-commerce sales, attract and acquire more uh, online customers, right? So you will have multiple business initiatives parallelly running at, a, at any given time, right? So it's better if you can collect a couple of these together, right? Because otherwise IT team will have to continuously call, you know, while they are uh, trying to connect to your data sources at the same time, sales and distribution team has started another initiative and then they want IT team support for that as well, right? So better put everything together as an organization, identify for each, data source now there will be different data sources for an example now this is a supermarket right now for this supermarket uh, you will have point of sale system which has the real time sales data then you will have your back end inventory system then you will have your master piles product master then you will have your replenishment system the procurement system right then you will have innovative data sources like event calendar uh, shop flow blue, blueprint the layout right uh, store inventory, promotional campaigns coming from marketing team, innovative and big data sources like weather information, right? Google reviews and ratings, product recommendations, right? 
social media request chatbot outputs right so you list everything and for each business initiative you evaluate which are the highest important or the topmost data sources you need to implement each of these initiatives right now for an example for the cost to serve decrease of optimization business initiative google's reviews may not require because you are not looking at the end consumer probably you are looking at your distributor end and probably the retail end right so for that google review try to extract google reviews for that business strategy is not that important doesn't generate much wealth but your current uh, uh, sales is very much important right okay so likewise you do an evaluation right so you identify which data sources had the highest value now if you take point of sales transaction you can see it is required for all three initiatives that we uh, that we want to implement so it has the highest right okay so likewise we identify each data source by its value and then a second matrix to identify the implementation feasibility or the data acquiring feasibility right so this can be this is where it team can step in right they know uh, your internal systems and how accurate they are the quality of data how clean the data is the granularity level of data cost of acquiring data say for an example in order to incorporate whether you have to pay uh, and subscribe to an api that has a cost and how you extract those api information into your system another cost you need another server to run right so likewise you evaluate the implementation feasibility of these data sources right so you have the value of the data source and the implementation feasibility right so you put that into a matrix right a score right implementation feasibility versus business value right okay a final score it's better if we can you know uh, come up with an overall score for each business initiative right each project right so for each project based on the data sources that we need the value they add and the implementation feasibility of it we rank them we calculate a final score and we plot them implementation feasibility versus business value right so the very first thing an it team will love this because they have they will have to work on only one at a time so you are not parallelly trying to work with every business initiative you identify the business initiative which delivers the highest business value with the lowest implementation feasibility sorry highest implementation feasibility so other way around right highest business value with the highest uh, implementation feasibility right that means these are like low hanging fruits you can easily implement it plus it delivers highest business value right so you go ahead with that right easy thing to do and it team will be happy because they will focus on acquiring one set of data first right but then when it comes to second one these values will change because certain data sources you have managed and acquired in your first initiative so when it comes to second initiative it's not uh in unfeasible to implement right now because of the effort you put in the uh, first initiative now the second initiative looks feasible that's what happened right so that's the implementation part of it right okay so a lot of information i know right don't get overwhelmed by all the information uh but this is try to understand this as a process right and there are no magical solutions as i mentioned last week also right there are no ma magical solutions you have to go through this process and step by step move from business monitoring to business insight finally to business optimization right all right so 
I think uh, I took all the time and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have, but do we have any questions? I saw a few in the Q&A session. Uh, yes, thank you, Tisara. Uh, we are now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's session, as well as the unaddressed question of, uh, from our previous day session. Uh, Tisara, shall I read, it, uh, read the questions for yeah. you so that you can yeah. answer? Okay. Uh, the first question is, is it possible to incorporate data science when we do correlation coefficient analysis between herbal phytochemical substance and soil chemical substance? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so correlation in itself is uh, sort of analytical model, right? Which means you are doing, it's, see the difference is how you do it, right? So let's say now I'm not an expert in in, uh, in that uh, data science part. Now, if you are doing this as uh, part of, you know, in a statistical sampling model, right? Uh, building the correlation, right? If you are doing it with sampling, the difference between that and implementing data science is now data science will look at how you can capture this data, uh, not a sample, but whether there are any uh, method to uh, capture this in a, you know, could be a new innovative uh, data source or any unstructured data source. Uh, it could be some uh, third party resources, right? Something like that. And try to work with that entire data set, right? So you can uh, improve. I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to, if you're trying to build a relationship, right? Uh, rather than building the obvious one, you can try to understand a lot of hidden patterns and things like that, right? Uh, so that is where you can incorporate data science into a business case like this. Uh, but I'm not sure exactly what sort of data you are working on, but uh, if you have like, if you want to discuss more, uh, maybe you can contact me and I can see what sort of data set you have and what sort of what type of data you uh, can collect and then maybe incorporate more advanced uh, maybe pattern recognition or clustering or maybe even like uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. Okay, thank you, Tisara. The next question is, what is the relationship of data science to Python programming language? Yeah, that is what I did uh, with R, right? So now, right now, uh, you are doing your uh, basic analysis uh, using Excel sheets, right? Or maybe you are using some visualization techniques in your BI visualization platform like uh, Tableau or Power BI, right? Now, those can't accommodate advanced analytical models, right? Now, for an example, now our forecasting model, which has 20,000 SKUs, you can't even think of forecasting 20,000 SKUs in an Excel sheet. And it gets worse because 20,000 SKUs, if you have 100 outlets, right, you are looking at 100 into 20,000 combinations, 100 into 20,000 different demand patterns, right? And it gets further, you know, complex, complicated because all these at the aggregate level, you need to reconcile, right? So all your outlet sales, outlet forecast, finally should match with your national sales forecast value. So if you forecast them differently, national forecast as separate demand pattern, outlet forecast, 100 outlet forecast as different 100 different uh, demand patterns, it won't get reconciled, right? So there are advanced models like hierarchical forecasting, in order to facilitate this, which you can't do uh, with your typical uh, BI tools, 
right? Then you need to uh, start looking to more advanced modeling capabilities. And best thing to look at is a programming language like R O Python, which are open source and which provides a lot of support to develop advanced algorithms like that. Okay, uh, thank you, Tizara. That's all about our Q and A queries we have received from participants. And for the audience, if you have any further questions or any of the questions were not answered during today's session, you may send an email to Tisara on his email address, keeping us in the loop. Tisara will try to revert you with the answers as soon as possible. Sure, sure. All right, we reach to the end of our two days insightful session. Our objective of this two day session was to give an insight to use big data and data science in your organization to get the maximum value. We believe that we have achieved our objective and given a perfect platform on the subject, which will help you in your work environment. We will be sending the recording of today's session to you, uh, to your respective email addresses in due course. Sir, I must mention our deep sense of gratitude to you for giving us this great opportunity to gain much important insight and we were fortunate to engage an eminent resource person like you, who is one of the experts in this area. And once again, thank you very much Tisara, for accepting our invitation with no hesitation, irrespective of your busy schedule and also providing valuable inputs and a friendly collaboration to the committee in organizing the webinar. We wish you success in all your future endeavors. Tisara, thank you very much once again. Thanks, Vashir. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, CA Sri Lanka Great Chapter, and uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, an event like this cannot be successful without all of your participation. So on behalf of the Executive Committee, I take this opportunity to extend my sincere gratitude to all CA members and non-CA members, participants, from Kuwait, Sri Lanka, GCC countries, and around the world. And we believe that the webinar was really informative and beneficial to all of you, and your active participation made this event a very success. Finally, and very importantly, a big thank goes to the executive committee for organizing this webinar. We really believe that the valuable feedback from participants will help us to further improve our future events. Therefore, before wrapping up this session, we kindly request from all our participants to click on the link provided in the chat box and spend a couple of minutes to provide <coughs> your valuable feedback on the session. Thank you everyone and we will meet you soon with our next event. Until then, stay safe and have a great evening. Goodbye.